It's been more than 50 years since I first clapped eyes on Mabasa. I came here for a party and it was love at first sight. What struck me first was the pink marble against the grey of the building. It's such a galah of a place. In 1969, this place was a rabbit warren of run-down flats. It was cold and drafty and leaky as a sieve. There was a pervading smell of cat's pee, damp. There were creaking floorboards and ancient loos. And yet, Labasa's beauty shone out. The old girl had class. I had to live here. Finally, in 1971, a room became vacant, appropriately enough, in the servants' quarters, and I moved in. This was one of the more posh rooms, a party room. I can't remember exactly who lived here. It was a shifting population, but all the tenants at La Bassa at the time were a very motley crew of actors, writers, painters, teachers, librarians, photographers, the occasional drug dealer, the occasional pop star. And not all of them treated this place with the respect it deserved. Some of them, not saying who, some of them rode their motorbikes in through the back entrance, along the tiled veranda, round the beautiful staircase, out the ornate front door, before parking them inside to drip oil on the parquet floors. In 1971, I was in my fourth year at university, um, I rode a motorbike. Uh, the year before, my father had just died, so I'd only been out of home a short time and I'd had to go home again. So I was in that breaking period between living at home and being an independent young woman. Um, I was pretty much a full-time student out at Monash, but I was also teaching part-time out at Dandenong Tech and getting more and more involved in uh, alternative theatre at La Mama in Carlton uh, and later the Pram Factory and also singing in uh, rock and roll bands, in uh, performing at Sunbury uh, with a crazy band called Lip and the Double Decker Brothers uh, and the fabulous Lipettes. I was a Lipette. Um, so it was quite a full life living on a shoestring budget and eating a lot of Hunza pie. <laughs> well, it was a big collection of people who lived here. I first came here because I knew someone from Monash and she was holding a party uh, and I came to that party and that's how I first saw the place. Because you'd never know this place was here driving down Orong Road. And to discover this incredible place was amazing and the collection of people who were living here. Um, so, as I said, there were quite a lot of people living here from Monash University, but there were people like Judy Cordingly, uh, who was an archivist at the State Library, and she was like a kind of mother hen here at uh, La Bassa. You know, you, you would spend a bit of time in Judy's little kitchen under the stairs, and she was in one of the front flats. Out in the back flat where I lived in the servants' quarters, um, I moved in originally with Peter and Sandy Sinnott, who were, if you looked at George Harrison and Patty, his wife, they were the absolute mods of the time, like perfect pink and purple. Both of them wore those colours. They decorated their flat in those colours. So, and they had quite straight jobs, as, as I understand. Uh, whereas the rest of us were really, you know, having part-time work or uh, were students. 
Um, so there was Judith Brooks was in the front room. Uh, later at our flat, Faye Mokotov moved in, who was an actor, and quite a lot of other actors from a group called Tribe, who I'll talk about later. I really wanted to go up to the tower, you know, famously quoted in that marvellous poem, uh, 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 at Labasso, room eight by five, just fantastic. And I wanted to go up there, but it was boarded up. Uh, the previous tenant that I remember was a pop star who used to take his morning urination out of one of the windows of the tower. That was the famous moment up there in the tower. But it was boarded up uh, and considered too dangerous for the tenants to go up. So I never had that pleasure of going up there or going out onto the roof. I really wanted to go out onto the roof because that was one of the things you did here. But by the time I'd moved in, that was just not allowed anymore. I don't believe in ghosts, but my little room uh, in flat one overlooked the rear courtyard and there was a constant sound of dripping and the light on the back of the stained glass window with that very spooky little satyr in the corner would give rise to people with imagination of those things, imagining hauntings. But I do remember the story that I was always told about Labassa, which was that um, it was built by Mr. Robertson. Maybe it was him that they were talking about, but whoever built it, built it for his love in England and made it pink and grey and it's such a feminine sort of building. And she came all the way out by ship, took one look, hated it and went home again. That was the story I was always told about Labazza, which I've since learned is completely wrong. But I quite liked that idea because it sat with my notion of, of, of the romantic architecture of this place. The I mean, surely the most unusual colouring for a building. I, I, I can't think of anywhere else that I've seen of stately mansions that have that pink and grey, which is at once beautiful and romantic, but so Australian. It's like our beautiful, you know, gum nut baby trees. It's like our galas. It's something that, you know, blends the Italianate architecture with Australia. So I quite liked that story fitting with that. It was a hotbed of drugs in, uh, at um, La Bassa. That's true. People smoked pot. They took acid in this very room. <laughs> People would come. I had um, had the great fortune in uh, 1970, the year before, to have a terrible time smoking pot. Uh, it was so extreme and uh, so devastating for me that I never smoked pot again and I never... I, I, you know, I didn't take any other drugs for the rest of my life because I'm just a person that it doesn't suit. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I used to say, I'm already in that state. I don't actually need to get high. <laughs> but it had been a bad experience for me. But I was surrounded by everybody else who was smoking pot. Uh, so definitely a lot of the cleaning of the walls that had to be done in La Bassa, all that black charcoal that had to be scraped off the walls. A lot of it came from cigarettes and a lot of it came from marijuana. So um, yeah, people did, but that was what the culture was then. I was just a weird oddball uh, who'd had a bad time and I tried. It was really difficult for me because my whole social framework was constructed around, you know, passing a joint around or getting high and dancing, helicopter dancing, um, and I couldn't do it anymore. And I didn't drink. God, I was the most boring woman in the world. I made up for it in other ways. <laughs> this was my home for three years. The entire flat, $27 a week. Mind you, I was earning $8 a week as a waitress. Three rooms off a long corridor accessed by a very steep flight of stairs, which I used to fly up and now I struggle up. An incredibly large bathroom uh, with a clawfoot bath beautiful clawfoot bath, but because of Peter and Sandy's predilection for pastels, it was painted 
purple. It was beautiful. My room, second along, was a large room with a working fireplace and a lovely window that overlooked the rear courtyard and the back of the stained glass window. When I moved in, uh, the person who had it before me had a large brass bed, which I got to use for a long time, full of pot plants. It was just fabulous. And then there was the door to nowhere. Now you can't open the door, but in the olden days when we lived here, it just opened out onto nothing. It must have gone somewhere sometime, but when I was here, you used to be able to open it up and I could sit on a sunny day with my legs dangling over a sheer drop and the car park out the back and look across the courtyard thinking of what it used to be like here as I gazed across at the beautiful old magnolia tree which was in the rear garden of a house on Orong Road, long gone. When I moved into this flat, I think it was just Peter and Sandy who lived here and also um, the guy I moved into uh, his flat. He was just going to be away for a short time and I was going to look after his, his, his flat. But um, Ron Blair was his name and he never came back, which was fantastic. <laughs> he came back to take away the, the brass bed and a few of the pot plants, but um, he was my way in. Um, and then when Peter and Sandy moved out, uh, Faye Mokotov moved in and Faye Mokotov and I were part of a group, uh, an acting group, a theatre group called Tribe and we began uh, out at Monash. Um, there was a, a, a really a seminal kind of director um, from Brisbane at the time named Doug Anders and he'd come down to Monash to perform in the um, uh, theatre festival that I helped run in 1968 and he ran these classes in South Melbourne that were based on all the exercises from NIDA and quite a few of the students from Monash went to those classes and we became part of his group that was known as Tribe. So I was talking before about how the Australian Performing Group were writing plays about Australia and about us and our lives. We were performing plays that were alternative plays in Europe and America, like the Living Theatre of New York and Jean-Claude Van Italy and Arto and the Theatre of Cruelty. And we performed a lot of plays that we group developed at La Mama. We took our clothes off quite a lot of times at La Mama. In fact, I've probably taken my clothes off at La Mama more times than I have at home. Um, beneath the strobe lighting and the doors pumping away. And so we kind of lived in all these collective houses and uh, Faye came to live here. Carol Porter, who was another formative member of Tribe, lived here and Alan Robertson, who later went on to work with Circus Oz. Uh, he used to build all the fantastic machinery for Circus Oz. And Carol came out of the section of uh, Tribe that grew out of uh, RMIT's School of Painting. So she brought not only her performance abilities, but also her incredible visual uh, things for sets. And she, she made sculptures in here out of resin and chicken wire and human hair. So it was really a pumping hotbed of creativity. Uh, the whole building, but, but particularly flat one number two, the servants' quarters, where a few people from Tribe lived. And of course, we were working in at La Mama. We were still sort of connected to Monash, so it was a real crossroads time for all of us, uh, putting on plays on the other side of town, sampling our first cappuccinos and Italian food over there, but living here in Caulfield uh, in this brilliant manner of a place. Um, so we were this little section, but there were all the other sections who were people who were teachers and librarians, as I've said. La Bassa left a lasting impression on my subconscious. It's the place to which I return most often in my dreams. My life here was as complex and ornate as the building itself. But increasingly, all roads were leading to Ligon Street. <laughs>